Welcome everyone to another edition of CHP Talks. We are live today here with Rod Taylor and uh, our special guest, Pastor Kevin Cavanaugh. And Rod, if you want to just say a few words of introduction. Well, we're so pleased to have uh, Pastor Cavanaugh with us. Uh, he is the pastor for 22 years of Cedar Grove Baptist in Surrey. And I've had the privilege of uh, sitting in the worship there and joining with them at various times. Uh, he's also uh, head of the Surrey Pastors Network, and he's, uh, for in recent years, I, we're going to find out from him exactly when this started, One Accord and so on, but uh, he's been involved with One Accord, a bunch of pastors uh, who are working to bring righteousness back into this nation. Uh, he's traveled extensively uh, representing One Accord and talking to pastors throughout the country, particularly in uh, Alberta and Ontario, and it's just a real privilege and a pleasure to have you with us today, uh, Pastor Kavanaugh, and uh, we'll, we'll launch in here. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, listen, I'm, I'm very deeply happy, uh, uh, honored to uh, be invited to be with you guys and blessed to be able to talk about these things, these important things that we're all facing here in the nation. How did you, how did you get started with One Accord? How did this all sort of become a reality uh, network? Cause. Peter, it started. Um, <clears throat> it started in the fall of uh, 2018, and uh, I, I was actually away. On, I was actually in Armenia when I got a message, uh, an email from a parent uh, who didn't even attend Cedar Grove, who actually emailed me and said that his child in a secondary close to our church had been forced along with the entire classroom to actually uh, uh, in a drama class to role play themselves coming out as gay, lesbian, transgender, or what have you. Wow. And the parent was just totally beside themselves, of course. So we, we started getting these messages that uh, this stuff was actually starting to come into full gear. It, it surrounds a curriculum, uh, actually a, a, a more than a curriculum, it sounds, surrounds a theory of education that is actually uh, intended to infiltrate every single curriculum in the schools here in BC and across Canada by the name of SOGI, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. So in that it is a whole theory of, uh, or a philosophy of education, it's actually worse than a curriculum <laughs> because they're intent on actually finding ways to build it into everything. So in 20, uh, 2018, uh, we started uh, several uh, friends out here. I think uh, your listeners would probably know Carrie Simpson and Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson and uh, Pastor Paul Dirks. We started actually uh, training pastors, uh, uh, primarily Pastor Dirks, in uh, a, what he called dovetail. He's turned into quite an exceptional researcher and uh, has presented just fabulous information for us about how this is impacting people and families and children and, and everything from a, from a biblical perspective. So I, I'm getting to it, it's a little bit longer, uh, bear with me, I'm, I'm just about there. So uh, in the fall of 2018, we actually um, decided to invite Carrie. So we were hosting these teachings, but we decided to invite Carrie to come and speak to our parents and immediately Cedar Grove came under threat uh, and attack. I, I still have some of the uh, letters, one of them saying that if we went through with this meeting that I'd be reported to the uh, RCMP uh, to be investigated for hate crimes and hate literature. And wow. <laughs> you can imagine on any pastor how this, would, how this would impact any pastor. This was a Friday. They were threatening. Then all of a sudden on uh, social media, there were all these threats about the fact that they're going to show up at Cedar Grove and all this stuff. And so it was there and then that I, I, I felt like I had a Holy Spirit moment. I was here at my home on Friday because I take that day as my Sabbath. And um, <clears throat> normally 
I'm not one to step back from a fight. I'm one to step into it. But I really sense that the Holy Spirit uh, apprehended my heart that morning and said, this time you're stepping back. Because to step into this is exactly what they want to have happen. And they're going to come around and make you the poster boy. And they're going to wipe you out. Because virtually no one was standing publicly. From a, from a biblical Christian standpoint, none, none, that I, none that I was aware of, certainly no pastors. And it was then, uh, Peter and Rod, that I felt like the Lord was helping me to see that, that if someone didn't rise up and actually call a band of pastors to stand together and to link arms together theologically, practically, and in whatever way, that they'd actually pick us off one by one. And so that really was uh, how the vision for what, what initially was the West Coast Christian Accord launched as the West Coast Christian Accord. That's how, that, that was the seed that the Lord put into my heart. And we began to call uh, pastors, uh, two uh, uh, important pastors uh, in, in this work were Pastor Giulio Gabelli and Pastor Dave Carson. The three of us began to call pastors together and we began to actually meet together to discuss uh, putting together this very, very important, uh, what's turned into this very important uh, document and, and these uh, 15 article, 14 articles. So um, the first time I saw you on a video, I don't know if I ever mentioned this to you, was uh, you and Pastor Julio were being interviewed by Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson regarding uh, Franklin Graham's uh, trip to Vancouver. And, and I think that was an eye opener, you know, for her, I think for the viewers as well, that there were people within pastors, even within the churches of Vancouver and presumably other places who would resist having a man come to speak because of his uh, uh, support of God's righteous uh, decrees. Uh, so that kind of, to me, I'm not sure what, what year that was, but uh, that was the first time I saw you. And I, I sort of have seen your involvement deepening since then, as well as uh, being able to encourage other pastors to get involved. Uh, so uh, how difficult was it to uh, engage pastors, uh, to contact them? Did you when when you started the, the West West Coast Accord, which became one accord, what was the first response from pastors? You know, uh, Rod, you you reference it back to Franklin Graham, and I think that's a good reference point because uh, that was an awakening for for me personally. Again, I uh, was sitting here in my home. I was working on a message when I got an email from a group of, because I was, on the, uh, I was on the executive committee, I got an email, we got an email from a group of uh, pastors, evangelical pastors, what, what we would have considered our partners, some of our friends, who were reaching out to us to, to ask us to disinvite Franklin Graham. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I, I was shocked. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I literally did some somersaults internally. And, you know, I, I was, uh, frankly, I was just confused thinking, how could these, you know, I mean, this is a man of God, a preacher of righteousness, a preacher of the Bible, a preacher of the gospel. How can you, how could you say something like this, right? How could you do this? And they listed four things. And one of those things was his stance on LGBTQ issues. And it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, where, where have we gotten to? So that actually awakened uh, pastors like uh, uh, Giulio Gabelli and Dave Carson and I to the fact that uh, what we would have assumed as uh, uh, what it meant to be an evangelical, you could no longer assume. Even Baptist churches, Mennonite churches, you know, uh, Pentecostal churches, you can't just assume. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think we all know that more today. You just cannot assume uh, 
that these churches are actually any longer fundamental conservative uh, Bible uh, preaching, Bible believing places. Uh, the challenge is, is that, you know, I, I'm actually, and I've stated this many times, I'm probably as much or more concerned with the gay affirming movement in the evangelical church than I am Soji being taught to the public schools. Because you and I know once the righteous foundation of the church is destroyed, we've got nothing. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So you've identified two uh, main issues. Um, just now the uh, rise of gay affirming um, practice, belief, teaching, whatever, um, and also um, the, the curriculum in the schools, the, the whole mindset in the schools. Are there other uh, issues, are there other causes that One Accord has been active on? I mean, those two alone would be, would be enough to start an organization, no doubt. <laughs> those two are enough alone to get one arrested. Let's just go there. <laughs> and, and those two alone are enough to get one to lose his job. So going back to what Rod was asking about how pastors are responding, uh, boy, this has been really enlightening. Uh, it's been um, very discouraging at times, very disappointing. Uh, we, we started off by inviting key leaders from across the region to come and actually pray together, reason together, think together, and formulate these 14 articles. And it was amazing. You know, I'm, I'm just going to share with you one story, and certainly no names, but one pastor, a very, very highly influential man in the Asian community. Uh, the first time we met, he, he was you know, he was so over complimentary, you know, Pastor Kevin, we think what you're doing is amazing. We're behind you 100%. We'll stand with you. Uh, we agree with you. We, we, we bless you. And then within a few weeks, they totally dropped out. Mm -hmm. And here's the reason why. So once we finalized, I, I should say a few months, because we, we actually did this for a couple of months. Once we finalized the 14 articles, of what we think is a very solidly biblical stand on uh, marriage, sexuality, and gender. These guys presented it to their younger leaders, and their younger leaders refused to sign it. Wow. And this is, this is the case over and over again, <clears throat> is the older leaders are kowtowing to the younger leaders, and, and, it's, and it's basically basically under the guise of we won't let it divide us and, and so here coming back to this issue about pastors okay and what i've had to come back to and to say hey friends listen there's a place where jesus unites and there's a place where jesus divides mm -hmm. and and sometimes jesus is actually gonna intentionally divide us when it has to do with theological matters of truth that people are, are gonna compromise on, it's gonna create division, okay? And so that's why from a theological standpoint for myself, I want to and have, because see, this is kind of the confusing thing. I'm a Pentecostal Baptist. I, I have friendship with people in every denomination. I'm as interdenominational as they come. I lead an interdenominational prayer movement. I was with pastors yesterday from different denominations, different theologies, the whole nine yards. So I want to minimize the essentials, but over the essentials, I will die and I will divide. Mm -hmm. So somebody starts telling me that Christ is not, not, uh, not the divine son of God, uh, uh, bloodshed, resurrected one, we're done, <laughs> okay, in terms of fellowship. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about people claiming to believe or somebody tries to tell me that the word of God's not the word of God, we're done. I don't, I don't have any place I can go with you, okay? Uh, so, we, so, so we have some essentials like that, but now I'm adding the essential of gender, okay? You start to tell me 
that uh, sexuality and gender is up for grabs and that you can be, you can do whatever you want and, and believers can disagree on this. I'm saying no, no, they actually can't. Okay. We can't disagree on this. In the beginning, God created male and female. He created he, them, male and female. He created he, them, and he blessed them. And if you and I, if you and I start to put that up for debate, we're in a, we're in a whole lot more trouble than we are today. Oh, for sure. No. So with uh, your travels across the country, are you finding uh, basic same temperature of the water in different provinces or, or are you finding a different uh, setting? Uh, are, where, where is the church at across country? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I wish I could give you a better report. Uh, I just uh, was on a call uh, last uh, a week ago, Monday, with leaders from across the nation who had invited me in, wanted to have this kind of conversation uh, some some uh, significant players, uh, good godly uh, people, and I, I, I'm afraid I wasn't able to give them the report they were hoping for. Mm. Um, and and I'm not a pessimist. I, uh, most people would see me as a pretty significant <laughs> optimist. Uh, and I'm always shocked when it doesn't go the right way. I'm always shocked when things don't actually turn out, you know, really well. Uh, but I've had to deal with a lot of disappointment. And um, I found some, some wonderful hot spots in Ontario. I've uh, been to Ontario twice. I've spoken to uh, several thousand people there. Found a wonderful invitation uh, from some people. I spoke in a large Pentecostal church. The pastor didn't know me from Adam, turned the whole service over to me. I was just blessed out of my socks. Uh, Pastor Pat Francis back there, she in welcomed me. It was beautiful opportunity situations. Um, uh, Pastor David uh, Lo uh, Loganathan, a, a wonderful, uh, a very influential uh, prayer leader back there, uh, who's a Sri Lankan in the Pentecostals. So some warmth there and strength there. Uh, <clears throat> Alberta has uh, invited me many a number of times. <laughs> I've been all over Alberta now, and I uh, have just met some beautiful Christians and some strong-hearted ones. Vern Rand from the Koyaneus schools there in Alberta. Man, I love that guy. Him and his uh, executive assistant Mary Lou Stacy. They are just powerhouses for God. I mean, they wow. stood against the whole government there. And uh, in grace and in truth, and I just love being able to minister amongst their group. Uh, but Pastor Joe, our brother Jojo Ruba, Faith Beyond Belief, a shout out to him. And that is one amazing man of God who is leading the charge yeah. like few others in the nation, bold as a lion. And, uh, of course, he's standing right now on, on this uh, conversion therapy ban and uh, Boy, he's, he's rallying pastors like nobody's business yeah. uh, in Alberta. And so I'm very encouraged. That's a very encouraging situation. They're having prayer meetings every week. They're strategizing. They're preparing. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, this conversion therapy ban, you talk about something satanic and demonic. In, uh, in Alberta, they have been going strategically municipality after municipality and, and shutting this thing down like nobody's business. I mean, people, if anybody, when you get back to these pastors, they all realize, friend, right now they're being counseled. You talk about the stuff, you're going to jail. You're, yeah. you're potentially going to go to jail. I mean, this is getting very, very, yeah. very serious. It's a one-way street, too. Like, the, they don't mind if you convert someone from uh, a heterosexual, you know, what we would call normative, uh, you know, approach to life. Um, into something different, but to go back the other way, uh, they, they stand and they block it, right? It's and, twisted. Yeah. It's twisted. Now, you ask about hot spots. Uh, certainly out here in BC, there's some hot spots. We traveled for 21 days back in 2018 and led prayer meetings all throughout the province, 21 days a night of prayer and fasting. We led a movement called D21, Daniel 21 that uh, was 21 days of prayer and fasting in Alberta. We got one going in Saskatchewan and we got one going, well, you know what, I, I, we, I, I'm gonna pull back on Saskatchewan. 
Ontario, Alberta, and BC, we, we, we worked real well. The amazing thing, guys, is, is that we have almost no connection in Saskatchewan. Hmm. And that's mind-boggling to me. It's like I thought this is more like part of the Bible Belt and almost no connection in Manitoba. Yeah. You know what, no I th- what I think it is, uh, Kevin, right? politically, we look at these things politically. Uh, we have uh, not a very strong base, the Christian Heritage Party in Saskatchewan. But I think the reason for us is that they have been electing some of the best uh, MPs to the House of Commons, you know, overall uh, uh, for a long time. So they've had <clears throat> maybe less reason to think about these things, um, although I'm sure the concern is there. I have met with some people there, and and we have some new activity. But I think they've been sort of trusting in the the good people that have been representing them, and some still are representing them in the House of Commons. Uh, Kathy Wagenthal being one who's just introduced uh, uh, the Sex Selective Abortion Act and and has been very faithful in those exactly. things. But yeah, it's sort of like they've maybe been more self-contained and haven't felt as much the need to reach out. Uh, Manitoba took a dramatic step and uh, uh, introduced and passed conscience legislation. You know, this is tr- crossing into other topics, but conscience leg- legislation for doctors uh, regarding euthanasia and so on. So uh, there are pockets of uh, people that are willing to uh, do things, but they may not be connected, and, and they should be connected because we're going to need each other. You, you know, and, and you, you raise a very interesting point there, and that's part of the other thing that I've discovered is that we have not been wise about our networking and our connections. So I, we, we, we're still operating too much as individuals and silos, and we're not helping to provide a, a step, stepping stone for each other. So for instance, I'm convinced, okay, that if if someone's going to influence pastors, it's going to be a pastor, okay? You're not going to step into the, you're not going to step into this conversation as an outsider and tell tell me as a pastor what to do or how to handle this. It just doesn't make any sense because you don't know what I'm facing in my own congregation. And the heat that I can face even with my own leadership. So it takes a pastor really to speak to pastors. And yet here's the strange thing. An organization like yours might have connections or likely has connections with pastors in places like Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So if if we were acting wise, it would be you guys saying to them, hey, or to me, Here's somebody that you guys should connect with so that they can create a platform. Mm-hmm. My whole calling and interest is in, in mobilizing the pastors. Yeah. And I, I'm just convinced that, that my part of the game is to try to uh, support, strengthen, and encourage, and, and help revitalize pastors to stand for this nation. And uh, I, I feel like this issue, because I, 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 I would have never claimed to be a, a politically oriented person, but this issue has actually forced me out of the closet. It was like, this is the line. You've crossed it. Yeah, yeah. Now I can't, you know, this, it, it's changed my life in ministry, really. Yeah. yeah. It was either put up or shut up, I guess. It was. Yeah. So in the present context and looking to the future, uh, you said just before the call, we were talking a little bit, and you mentioned how the current uh, – pandemic, the current uh, self-isolation situation, everything that's happening that way is is shaking the church. Um, So thinking about that and looking forward to the future, what do you see as being sort of the next steps or the present opportunities? Oh my, you just, you just opened up a whole new can. (laughs) You you know, uh, I, I, I can let you know how I'm experiencing this and <clears throat> how this is impacting me personally and those that I connect with. So I was on a call with 35 other pastors on Tuesday. Um, 
I'm listening to pastors, I'm, I'm hearing, I have pastors calling me, asking me what I'm doing. I had a call from a pastor on, on, uh, on Tuesday afternoon this week. I had a couple from the week before. So none of us know what to do. Let's, uh, you know, let me just start with that. I don't know what to do. I'm not pretending to know what to do. Uh, I, I don't have all the answers, so I just want to be careful to say that. I'm just seeking to find the Lord in this. And I think that when, when the Lord shifts things, okay, when, you know, and, and <clears throat> so coming back to last week, when I stood up to speak for the first time in a live stream event without people in front of me virtually, I, I mean, everything changed last week. I, uh, you know, uh, and, and, ver and for the most part, we didn't have any choice. So uh, we had to go with it. We had to adjust with it or, or just be out of it. And I got up and said, you know, I, I felt like I had given birth last week, to be honest with you. I, I don't know if I've ever struggled more with a message in my entire ministry because I felt like, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a great series right now. I'm loving it. And I could have gone on without saying a word about the situation, but I thought that that's idiotic. This is what's on everybody's hearts. It's in their minds. They don't know what to do. They want to have a word. They want to know what God's doing. And so I gave a message I called a pandemic hope and, and shared reasons for hope in the midst of this crisis. But I actually preached on uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 13. <laughs> and and emphasize the fact that almost none of us know what 13 says because all of us focus on 14 that says if my people or some translations say and my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and then will I heal their land but verse 13 the reason why they're praying is because God has stopped the, he shut the heavens. God has sent plagues to get their attention, right? Mm. And so I, I came back to say, hey, friends, don't think God is not in this. Mm -hmm. God is actually right now trying to shake the world, but I'm convinced personally, and anyone can disagree with me, I'm happy to have you do it. I'm convinced that the thing that God is shaking, trying to shake the most is the church right now. Yeah. And I, I think he's trying to get he's trying to get my attention. I'm not pointing to anybody else. Okay, he, the, nobody else needs to be pointed to. He's trying to get my attention. He's humbling me, and he's humbling other leaders like me to realize that we could lose everything in a moment's notice, and everything we're trusting in apart from him could be gone. Right. Yeah. So, I just think it's a wonderful time. And I think God is helping us to reevaluate a lot of stuff and helping us to see what matters and what doesn't matter. And he's helping us to also understand that he's, he's not okay with what's going on. I mean, how do you, how do you start banning righteousness? How, how do you start legislating and legalizing sin and calling it righteous and God not be challenged? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I preached a couple of weeks ago about uh, uh, what happens when sin gets globalized. Well, we have evidence is what happens. The judgment of God falls. That's what happens. Yeah. And, and I think this is part of what we're facing right now. Yeah. Wow. Well, Kevin, it's uh, just so good. I'm so glad that you had the time to uh, meet with us today and 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 this isn't I'm not cutting you off that we can we can carry on a little bit but i did want to ask for people who are listening for our audience uh and there may be pastors among them or people who would want to let their pastors know about one accord or how they can get involved in in the pastor's movement toward the restoration of righteousness in canada uh where do they go you know i i would uh um really welcome people uh, who are e either if they're pastors or if they'd like to get their pastor connected to actually reach out to me directly. And my email is simply Kevin at the hyphen grove, G R O V E dot net. Kevin at the grove dot net. 
And then if they'd like to actually see or become a part of the commitment to stand and uh, uh, hold to these uh, principles of righteousness and battle for them, actually it's really a commitment to not only hold but battle, then they should go to our website, which is one accord dot one. One accord is one word dot one. Very simple. One accord. O N E. O N E. Yes. Okay, glad you clarified that. O N E. Accord. A C C O R D. Dot one. Dot the numeral one. Yeah. One and one and one. Okay. That the last is um, the numeral one or O N E. No, no, no. It's it's so it's O N E O N E. Okay. Well, I think this is a good time to say, is there, is there one thing that we, we didn't cover? Is there a final thought that you want to leave with everyone? Um, and uh, sort of go with that, and then we'll wrap up after that. Sure, sure. You know what? Um, as I'm preparing to speak into this again this week, uh, uh, my mind and my heart is brought back to uh, the situation with the widow at Zarephath. And uh, you remember that she, the, the situation in Israel was so dire that when Elijah came to her, she was preparing to cook her final meal and die. <laughs> okay. And you come back to ask yourself the question, uh, who created that situation? Why was there a famine that was killing people? Because God shut the heavens. And, and the fact is, is that God shut the heavens because they had an unrighteous prime minister, if you would. Now, of course, he was called a king, but it was the same role in terms of the sense of uh, primary authority. And uh, Ahab, as we know, had instituted all kinds of vile, unrighteous things that the, the prophets of God were hiding in caves. They were fearing for their lives. Mm -hmm. And I guess mm -hmm. I would say, uh, friends, all of us got to realize that the parallels to that time and our time are incredibly close. Mm -hmm. And it's time for us to actually speak up while we still have a voice and support those like the Heritage uh, Christian Heritage Party with people who are standing for righteousness. Stand with people who are standing. Support people who are standing. And I, I leave you with that, and I bless you. I thank you for this opportunity and honor to be with you guys. Well, thank you so much. We uh, so much appreciate you spending the time with us, and God bless you and your work going forward. May he open many doors, ears, hearts, eyes, and minds uh, to see, especially the leadership in, in the church in this country, uh, uh, transformed uh, so that they can accomplish all the, the work that God has prepared for them and for us. Uh, thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Thank you very much, Pastor Kevin. And uh, God bless you as you stand. Bless us all. And uh, for all of our viewers, thanks for watching. And we hope that you will join us again next week. We are trying to keep going with these CHP talks on a weekly basis. And uh, God bless you all. We'll hope to see you next week.